Good morning, folks. Uh, you're all very welcome to your service here this morning. And a great special welcome to Philip. And Philip, I look forward to your message to us this morning. And indeed, for anybody who is joining us in the comfort of their own home, it's great to have you tuning in. And we hope that you enjoy your time of fellowship with us this morning. There will be a short act of remembrance, um, with this being remembered Sunday today during the service. There's just a few announcements, uh, just to say that on Tuesday from 10 to 12, the Little Natter will meet in the, in the hall as normal, and then on Friday at 7.30, the bowling club will continue. And then next Sunday, morning worship will be here as usual at 10.30, and the Reverend Ken Robinson will be allowed to take the service next Sunday. So these are all the announcements you may remember them here. Thank you, Mark, for those words of welcome and the announcements. It's great to be here to, to worship God together on this Remembrance Sunday. Let's stand and sing our first piece, Love Divine, All Love Excelling.
unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, on this Remembrance Sunday, we are mindful of and, and, and give you thanks for the selfless love in which people over many generations laid their lives down, give their today for our tomorrow, put themselves in harm's way to secure for us the, the peace and security we now enjoy. And through those acts of, of selfless love, we are pointed to the divine love we just sang about, in which you entered our world as a, as a helpless being, born into poverty, kicking on the form of a servant, of no account or significance in this world, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, where you suffered the, the fullness of the divine wrath and judgment we deserved in, in our place, so that through your selfless act of sacrifice, we might receive eternal life, eternal peace, eternal freedom. We thank and praise you for that great love this morning. And Lord, on this morning we, we lift before you those in our armed services, both now and those who have served in the past. Many of them carry physical and emotional scars. We pray for your healing in their lives. We pray that they will be provided with all that they need, that they will know your, your presence with them and your grace sufficient for them. We, we pray for those um, defending our freedom today, putting themselves in, in harm's way. We ask for your protecting hand over them. We pray that through all that they face, they will be pointed to you and find lasting life, assurance and comfort in you. Watch over them and, and, and help them in their task. Lord, we also lift before you places in our world where there is conflict. In all those countries and regions, we ask for peace. We pray for political leaders in all areas of, of conflict to, to work together for, for peace and, and the well-being of, of all they represent. We pray for our own political leaders here in Northern Ireland, that they will set aside sectarianism and and petty, political, self-serving interests. That they will courageously serve us all and lead us forward. We pray for, for reconciliation and peace and forgiveness throughout our land. Lord, as we worship you this morning, we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you will meet with us. You will change us into your likeness. That we will be channels of your peace. That we, your people in this church, and indeed throughout your churches in this land, that we will be those who use to bring about real change. Meet with us this morning. Be glorified and exalted through our worship. And now we join our prayers together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We come now to our acts of remembrance. If you could be upstanding, please, if you're able. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Mm. Second hymn, O God our help in ages past.
We're reading this morning from the Gospel of John, John chapter 12, verses 12 to 26. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as King. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who, live, who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. We thank God for his word to us this morning. Recently, I came across the life story of Lieutenant Colonel William Dobby. In the year 1893, at the age of 14, he put his trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. Speaking about how he came to faith, he said this. On the first Sunday of November 1893, I realised for the first time, though I had often heard it before, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, laid his life down as the atonement for my sin, in order to deliver me from its penalty and power, so that I might be free. Burdened as I was with the guilt of my sin, I accepted Jesus as my Saviour. I rested my hopes on the plain fact that Christ had taken my place, and that I was able to make no contribution to his perfect work of salvation beyond gratefully accepting and acknowledging it. That was the turning point of my life. Once he finished his schooling, William joined the army. At the beginning of World War I, he was sent to the trenches as a commander. His letters home to his wife often contained the phrase, have faith in God. Any advancement he and his men made, he put down to the goodness of God. On the 11th of November, 19. 18. He was the senior on-duty officer in the advanced general headquarters. He had the privilege of drafting and sending the telegram that ended British involvement in the war at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Ten years after that, he was appointed as the commander of a small brigade 
in Jerusalem. With great bravery, he and his men protected the city from an invading horde that vastly outnumbered them. Out of gratitude, the Christian people in Jerusalem wanted to give a New Testament to every officer and soldier in the brigade. They asked Dobby to write a foreword to be added to each copy. His office looked out at the hill, which was believed to be the authentic site of Calvary. Sitting at his desk, inspired by the view, he wrote these words. You are stationed where the central event in human history took place, namely the crucifixion and death of the Son of God. You may see the place where this took place, and you may read the details in this book. As you do this, you cannot help being interested. But your interest will turn into something far deeper when you realise that it was for your sake that the Son of God died on the cross here. The realisation of this fact cannot but produce a radical change in one's life. And the study of this book under God's guidance will help you to such a realisation. Lieutenant Colonel William Dobby saw his comrades give their today for our tomorrow. He put his life on the line to gain for us the peace and security we now have. He sent the telegram that rightly makes this day the most important day in our national life. Yet, it was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and not the armistice which he described as the central event in human history. Why? Because the difference the armistice made in his life, as great as that was, peeled into insignificance when compared to the difference that Calvary made. The former gave him temporary peace, security and freedom whilst the latter give him eternal peace, security, and freedom. This passage affirms to us what William Dobby told his men, namely that the central event in human history took place on the hill called Calvary. The realization that Jesus Christ died there personally for you will produce radical and lasting change in your life. As we look at these verses, we will see how God made himself fully known to the world through his Son, and how we must come to Jesus if we are to receive the free gift of eternal life he gives. So how did God make himself fully known to the world through his Son? Not in the way that the fervent crowd or his disciples expected. This passage records Jesus' last entrance into Jerusalem during his earthly ministry. Excitement was at fever pitch. A week earlier he had raised Lazarus from the dead in the presence of many witnesses. All he heard about this believed Jesus to be the promised warrior king, who would lead them to military victory over their Roman occupiers, and thus establish Israel as an all-conquering world superpower. Verse 13, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. With joy and adoration, the gathered crowd proclaim Jesus to be their king, sent to them from God on high. Previously, as recorded in John chapter 6, when a crowd tried to take Jesus and make him their king, he withdrew from them because his time had not 
yet come. But now he acts differently, because at long last his time has come. Instead of trying to get away from the adulation and play it down, he embraces it in a way that says, yes, I am God's promised saviour king. Yes, this is the praise I am rightly due. After Jesus' entrance into the city, Andrew and Philip come to him in order to tell him that there are some Greeks who wish to see him. Jesus responds to their request with these words. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, for God to make his power and greatness fully known to the world through his Son. How Andrew and Philip's hearts must have been thrilled by that statement. Our years of being discounted and belittled by the world as, as a result of following Jesus are over. God is going to do something special and amazing through him. All the nations will know without a shadow of a doubt. He is God's appointed king and, and we will reign with him in splendour and majesty and never have to suffer in dignity again. If Andrew and Philip's hearts were thrilled as a result of Jesus telling them that the hour had come for the Son of Man to be glorified, oh, how their hearts must have sank when he told them how that would come about. Verse 23 and 24. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless the kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus would make his Father's glory and greatness fully known not by an act of might on a battlefield, but rather by dying on the cross in our place. Everything God is, everything God has to give, is laid bare and poured out to the world through the death of his Son on the cross. There God revealed himself to be the pure, self-emptying, unfathomable love that is the only source of eternal life. God made himself fully known to the world through his Son by giving him as a ransom for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust. How must we come to Jesus if we are to receive the free gift of eternal life he offers us? We must come to die with eyes that see the cross and the sacrificial way of the cross, not as foolishness and futility, but as glory. In verse 18 we're told the crowd came to see Jesus solely because they heard that he had miraculously raised Lazarus from the dead. They saw Jesus as nothing more than someone who could improve the conditions of their life in this world. Those who come to Jesus for this reason, who think faith in him should result in a prosperous, trouble-free life, have not met him in his full saving glory at the foot of his cross. Faith that is one foot in and one foot out, that has one eye on Jesus and one eye on the world to see what's more advantageous for us at any given moment. Such faith doesn't last. Though this faith acknowledges Jesus to be the Son of God, he died for us, we are not saved by it. John says this about it in verses 42 and 43 of this chapter. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. 
But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Faith that is true faith. Does not have one eye on Christ and one eye on the world. It has both eyes on him and both feet in. It sees the praise of men and everything else this world has to offer as emptiness and loss in comparison to the unsurpassable worth of knowing Jesus as our only hope and saviour. Come to Jesus Christ in true faith. Come without hope in yourself to die at the cross to everything you lived for apart from him. In the one who gave himself over to death, that you might be part of the fruit he bears to God, you will find lasting life, fulfillment and peace. Verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. When anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The word hate, as it appears in this context, is a well-known Jewish way of using it, which simply means to love less. We love meeting together with friends with whom we get along effortlessly and have many things in common. But when we see the cross as glory and the beginning of true life, we love it less than the thrill of opening up our fellowship to lonely and needy people who don't naturally fit in, for whom we have to adjust and make an effort. We love being kind to those who are kind to us. But when we see the cross as glory and the beginning of true life, we love it less than the privilege of reaching out in kindness to those who have wronged and hurt us. We love having time and space for ourselves. But when we see the cross as glory and the beginning of true life, we love it less than putting ourselves at the service of those whom God unexpectedly and without announcement sends into that time and space. We love having comfort, a good reputation and financial security in this world. But when we see the cross as glory and the beginning of true life, we love it less than the honour of putting those things on the line for the sake of Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus as we are, wearied and worn down by the cares of this life. Come with a contrite and broken heart that can say nothing else except, God be merciful to me, a sinner. You will see the cross and the sacrificial way of the cross no longer as foolishness and futility, but rather as the glory of God. Laying your life down for others, responding to evil with good, will no longer drain you dry and wear you down. Rather, it will fill you with true life, that loss and tribulation in this world for Christ's sake can only add to and enrich. Some time ago I watched a Second World War film called The Great Raid. The movie starts with the Americans landing in the Philippines and preparing to make their final push against the Japanese who had occupied the island from almost the start of the war. About 30 miles behind the enemy line, there was a, a POW camp in which 500 American soldiers were being held. 
I had a fear that the Japanese would, would massacre them in the face of defeat. The general over the invasion decided to send in a small raiding party to get them out. The raid was led by Colonel Henry Mucci. With minimal casualties, he managed to get all 500 POWs to safety. It remains the most successful raid in US military history. In the film, there is a conversation between Mucci and his second in command, Captain Robert Prince, prior to the mission. Captain Prince said to Mucci, the men are ready, they won't let you down. Mucci responded with these words, it's not a question of letting me down. We've worked hard to raise a fine unit. They deserve their shot at glory. To a confused Captain Prince, Mucci went on to say, I'm not talking about the publicity bomb. I'm talking about the kind of glory you carry inside you for the rest of your life, knowing that you've done something worth remembering, something that makes a difference. The only glory in which there is eternal life and riches is the glory that was revealed at Calvary. As it was for Mucci and his men, so it is for you and for me. We find this glory and make a lasting difference. Not by staying in the safety of our own little camp, where everybody thinks and behaves like we do. But rather by going beyond it into camps that other people control. If they are fellow believers who just see things differently than you do. In love, bend over backwards to find common ground and a common way forward. If they are unbelievers, lay yourself down for them as Christ laid himself down for you. Bless them when they curse you and go two miles with them when they ask you to go one. Walking in the way of the cross, which takes you far beyond the boundary of your own little camp, your own little safe and comfortable space. You will not fail to make a difference for God's kingdom. Enter that way by coming to Jesus Christ with no other plea but that he died for you. This will be for you the end of your life and the beginning of true life. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. But anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. My Father will honour the one who serves me. We thank God for his word to us this morning. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn. There is a redeemer.
we thank you that this morning you have met with us. If you have reminded us of that divine love in which you laid your life down for us. As you have done for us and has been exemplified by many uh, service people. We ask that by your grace as we look to you, we would do so for others. We would lay our life down to show them your love, to point them to you the only hope of eternal life for all. Sustain us by your love to make a difference in this world for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.